Thanks very much. Simon, what we're talking about tonight is quality investing. Um, it's not specifically about small caps. Obviously, the Off Wealth Prime small and mid cap fund that I manage, we manage it based on this methodology. But you can take this methodology and apply it to equity markets anywhere. Um, it's, it's a less talked about and probably less understood uh, investment philosophy than value and growth and all those other buzzwords that people throw around. And in fact, this is a homegrown one. This is what we've, we've worked out after many, many years of making mistakes and doing silly things and coming come to a conclusion what works and what doesn't. So jumping forward, just the agenda is obviously we're going to start off defining what quality investing is. That's always quite useful to set, set the groundwork. Then we're going to jump into the attributes of what makes a quality company. That is the non-financial attributes. So what you will find in this section is not a single mention of valuation metric, not a single mention of uh, financial metric, nothing. This is discussion on business models, ultimately. Then we move to the financial metrics uh, that uh, give proof towards quality and illustrate that because ultimately a quality business makes lots of money and grows fast and generates a fantastic investment return because that's the ultimate aim here. Yeah? That's actually what we're looking for. Uh, so there are ways to measure it over time. And then I'll give some examples where um, obviously talking my book, we hold these all in a small cap fund, um, but as a quality based a uh, small cap investor, this, uh, you know, I wouldn't be doing myself justice if I wasn't talking my book. So, and then jump to summary and questions. So that's, that's the agenda. Let's jump straight to what is quality investing? So first of all, there is a cognitive bias within the stock market. Large, large numbers, if not the vast majority of investors will look at stocks before they look at businesses. What that means is that there are criteria that most fund managers, most analysts, most investors, retail, private, institutional are looking for. If they're a value investor, they're looking for low price to book, low price earnings, low EV EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, various metrics. Uh, if they're a growth investor, they're looking for high earnings growth, uh, high cash flow growth, and so whatever, whatever. There's a whole long range of them, but they're all stock specific. And then, once they've filtered it and found it, they will look at the businesses. So what often happens is once a guy has looked at the stock, once an investor has looked at the stock and decided it fits his attributes, when he looks at the business, he already has a cognitive bias that he's not looking to find whether he should invest or not. He's looking to find why he shouldn't invest. Um, in other words, he will gloss over risks, uh, smooth over problems, and rationalize to himself why this stock that fits his attributes is in fact a stock he should invest in. The problem with this is that you are investing in underlying businesses. And as a long-term investor, in the short term, price is very important. In the long term, it's actually the business that's very important. So quality investing inverts this process. I don't look at stocks first. I look at businesses first. Quality investing first asks the question, is it a good business? If it is not a good business, then move on. Don't look at the stock. Doesn't matter what the valuation is. No valuation is cheap enough for you to care about it. If it is a good business, then we start to contemplate valuation. How much are you paying for it? And the combination of a good quality business at a low valuation tends to make for a very good investment. So why does this approach matter? Well, I've, I've touched on it already, that in the long term, your investment performance is only determined by the underlying business's performance. In the short term, many things from beta to volatility to what Trump tweeted last night can influence your, like your share price. But in the long term, it's only whether the business does well. So logically, good businesses do better than bad businesses. So investing in good businesses, you will do better than investing in bad businesses. And as much as it pains me to quote an overquoted person, Warren Buffett does actually say it really, really nasty is that 
Tom is the friend of a wonderful company and the enemy of a mediocre one because a good company will carry on being profitable and compound those profits year in, year out, decade in, decade out. A bad company, given enough time, goes bankrupt because that's the ultimate trajectory of a bad company. It's that simple. So in summary, quality investing is investing in good businesses. It helps you sleep at night. Uh, and a good, good mental test to know whether you think a business is good or not is are you excited for the next set of results? If you are terrified for the next sends a company publishes, you probably shouldn't be invested in it, particularly with a quality bias. So that's my, my big picture of what quality investing is, summarizing it. So it's, it leaves one, hopefully makes sense in terms of why we're looking at this and why we want to apply it in, to, to the investment world. But it doesn't answer the question of what makes a good, what makes one business good and one business bad, i.e. what are the attributes of a quality business? Inverted, if a business doesn't have these attributes, it's obviously not a quality business. It is a bad business. So the first one, or the first two, is barriers to entry and competitive advantages. People often use these terms interchangeably. That's wrong. These terms mean fundamentally different things. Barriers to entry stops, if you're an existing business, a barrier to entry stops new businesses starting up in your space because it's hard for some other reason, which I will go through. Whereas a competitive advantage, if you're an existing business, doesn't stop new competition coming here, but allows you to compete successfully versus existing competition. So fundamental differences between the two, but we can break down what they are. Barriers to entry to business, there's three types. There's legal barriers to entry. You have a piece of paper, a patent, a, uh, regulation, a regulatory issued something, a license, something that you have that is a legal barrier to entry that if you do not have, you cannot legally compete in this industry. For example, banks, EBSA up here on this slide has a banking license. If you do not have a banking license, you cannot be a bank. It is that simple. If you do not have a casino license, you cannot be a casino. If you do not have a telcos license, you cannot be a telcos. If you do not have, uh, and it goes on and on into pharmaceuticals and patents and various things like that, but there are legal barriers to entry. If you do not have, you cannot compete in the industry. Then you get natural barriers to entry, more subtle, but quite obvious with examples. So these are self-built barriers like brands, customer loyalty, switching costs are a subtle one, and they're a big one in financial services. All the penalties when you, when you switch your insurance or, or you change uh, like your medical aid or et cetera, et cetera. Switching costs are actual barriers to entry as well, and to some degree competitive advantages. There is a bleed between these two. But... Um, other examples of barriers, uh, barriers to entry in terms of the natural spaces, food brands, clover, for example. Anyone can buy a cow, milk it, and have milk. But if you're selling it to a random person on the street, uh, or if you were a person uh, buying milk at the shop, and you could buy some random milk from some random cow, or you could buy clover, you, a lot of people would trust clover. Brands uh, install various emotions, but uh, they are barriers to entry. Uh, another example in terms of natural barriers to entry, and just going back to EBSA, not just the banking license in terms of a legal barrier to entry, but a brand barrier to entry. How many of you guys bank with VDS Bank? Not that many. Probably don't trust them all that much. EBSA, on the other hand, though, you may like or dislike them, but... They're a bank, and you can more or less trust them with your money, and or at least that is probably what the brand perception is. So that's examples of natural barriers to entry. Um, scale is another one. Now, scale as a barrier to entry is the weakest of all the barriers to entry. The reason being is that there is a lot of money in this world, and if there is enough profit to be made into in a business, the capital will find it, more or less, given enough time. So being big, if that's your only barrier to entry, it's not a very good one. 
But being big is a barrier to entry, gives you returns to scale, and having large pools of capital that you can protect yourself with can prevent competition coming in. Examples of this is in manufacturing and construction, manufacturing particularly. Um, not just anyone, anyone can lay a couple bricks, probably. Not sure I could, I don't think I ever have, but um, in theory I could. Um, not anyone can handle a multi-billion rand construction contract. You have to be relatively big to do that. It's not even just skills, it's pure size. Uh, manufacturing, uh, this picture up in the top right is, I believe, a line of, uh, of uh, cans and the like that uh, NAMPAC, a NAMPAC factory has made. Now anyone can make a couple containers, but can you make millions of containers a day such that your unit costs drop because you're getting returns to scale on your fixed costs such that those containers cost only a few cents to make and you can sell them at only a few cents above that and make a margin? Not anyone can do that. That is what a returns to scale is. So these are the three barriers to entry, legal, natural, and scale. Then you get competitive advantages. Once again, these do not stop new competitors coming into the market. These are often unique to businesses and allow them to compete with existing competition and new competitors coming into the market. Um, once again, there are only three types of competitive advantages. You can either make a good or service cheaper, you can make it better, or you can make it different to anyone else. That is price, quality, and differentiation. Price, for example, in mines, because commodities in mines, whether you get iron ore from a Billiton mine or an Anglo mine or a Rio mine, it's still iron ore. The only difference is how much it costs them to make it. And that's an example of where scale barriers to entry and competitive advantages work in harmony, where down the bottom here, you have a massive, massive mine. Because it is big, it gets returns to scale, it can make the product cheap. Um, I'm not going to mention brands in this space that make cheap products, but there are plenty, plenty of them co that compete solely on price points, not on quality. Then you get quality, not uh, this middle picture down the bottom, not that I'm biased I'm, and I like Mercedes Benzes or anything. I was just trying to show a fancy car relative to a not fancy car. Um, I thought showing a not fancy car might be a bit personal, so I didn't go there. Um, but, you know, many people would perceive a Mercedes Benz to be a good quality car. Whether that's true or not, have any of you actually tested it? But you perceive it. That is competing based on quality. Uh, then you get niche or differentiation, what I mean by doing something different. What often happens in this space is there's a combination of brand and or intellectual property. Down the bottom right, you have Google, a hugely intellectually property rich, IP rich group. Not just anyone has Google's search algorithm. In fact, only Google has that. Not just anyone has Google's Android system. In fact, only Google has that. There is a brand element of trust and the like, but often in this technology space, as in the healthcare space where there's perhaps ethical drugs that only you have the formulation to, you compete because your product is different. And that's, that's often a very nice way to compete because you tend to get pricing power because of that. So. What you'll notice is that this slide, barriers to entry and competitive advantages, the higher the barriers to entry, the less the competition, hence the greater the profits within that industry. Com the better the competitive advantage, the higher the profits within that business. This slide often dictates the returns a company can generate, and not in one reporting period, consistently, over decades. If these get eroded or they get threatened, you're in trouble. If you reinforce these and you focus on them and you refine them, you're a sustainable business. That simple. Moving to the next slide is we've spoken about various entry competitive advantages as ultimately driving profits and profitability. This slide, I talk about scalability as an attribute of a quality company. Scalability it ultimately determines your growth profile. An investment, you can have a very, very small profitable business that is fantastic, but it will stay small. 
The stock market is growth hungry, so you want growth. You want a small business to grow into being a massive, large business. So we all get ludicrously rich along the way. That's why we all braved the cold and came out here tonight. That is scalability. So scalability, you either get it or, 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 or hopefully I'll explain it well. But scalability is a business's ability to grow its volumes faster than it grows its costs, i.e. it's the ability of a business to get exponentially bigger. It's a combination of a number of factors, size of the potential addressable market. Uh, a business selling, for example, and I'm using a very simple example, selling one single product, maybe it's leopard print yoga pants for middle-aged men, not a huge market. Uh, probably there are a couple out there that would want it, but um, once you've sold them a, a pair of it, how many of them would want another one? And how, many, how much growth potential is there in that market? You know, selling us in Iceland, probably not that many people who want it. There will be a small market for it, but that's about it. The point is you can never grow bigger than your potential addressable market and hence focusing on things that are, and I'll get to it in the latest slide, but eternal, wants, eternal needs and wants and desires means that you can largely address everybody on planet Earth. So your addressable market is Earth, which is a good market to be. Um, but scalability is a combination of potential, potential, potential addressable market. Also, the incremental marginal cost of further volumes. So cell C, for example, uh, as, as a, an example of a telcos, can keep signing customers. And because it's got spare capacity left on its network, it's not going to cost cell C much more. So every additional customer falls to its bottom line. Uh, Facebook as well. Uh, Facebook, you can keep making accounts. And it's not going to cost Facebook all that much to keep making accounts. But when it gets to a point where the entire world has an account on Facebook, they're going to be very, very profitable. Because, uh, And I get back to my potential addressable market. Um, both of these are communications companies. Um, so the potential, potential addressable market is the whole world. Um, but the ability to reach the whole world doesn't necessarily cost a huge amount once you've got your original cost base. Uh, Facebook more so than Sol C, uh, but Sol C from a national perspective, absolutely. Um, then there's also the ability of the core business to efficiently handle volumes and all of this. And that speaks really to the marginal, the incremental marginal cost of adding one more sale or one more user or one more like a product uh, in, uh, onto the business. All of these wrapped together in, in a term you've probably heard before, it's called a platform business. Social media exploded a couple of years ago um, and the stock market's been struggling with valuations because they are nearly infinitely scalable. So what is it worth? It's worth a hell of a lot if you, if you have it um, because it's a platform business. Um, it's as it gets bigger and bigger, it gets not less profitable but more profitable. Um, and it gets stickier and stickier, and it just makes infinitely more money. In theory, uh, we, we, we'll see. So other types of these sort of scalable businesses is asset management, Coronation. Coronation currently manages about 500 billion uh, assets. They probably would not need to hire a single more employee if they, manage, if they doubled that, if they managed a trillion. They maybe wouldn't even need to hire more, uh, more analysts or fund managers if they, uh, if they manage 10 times that. Point is, whether you're managing one rand, 500, million, uh, 500 billion, or a trillion, you're probably using more or less the same overheads because um, it's intellectual property and uh, smart, good-looking people like me that, uh, that uh, do that stuff. Then telcos, I've touched on that, software, uh, many, many others. I just want to note here because what happens a lot on the, on the JSC, actually on stock exchanges everywhere, not singling out the JSC, um, but smart executives sell acquisition strategies to investors as growth strategies. They work. They're good if well executed and bedded down. But an acquisition strategy is not scalable. The reason a business growing by buying other businesses is not scalable is because as you buy other businesses and get bigger, two things happen. And ignoring the obvious complexities and all the risks involved, two simple things happen. 
you need to find bigger businesses to buy to have the same impact. Because if you're a one rand business, you buy another one rand business, you become a two rand business. If you buy another one rand business, well, then you only go up by 50%, you're not doubling. So an acquisition strategy does not scale because you have to keep, get, keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And each bigger acquisition, by the way, you need to spend more capital on. So note the incremental cost of further volumes here, in fact, goes up, not down. Acquisition strategies do not scale. They are not, they are not a, 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 a attribute of a quality company. They can supplement it, but they are not an attribute. So what you will notice is this first slide, attributes of uh, like a barrier to entry and competitive advantages, ultimately talks to the profitability, the sustainable profitability of a business. The scalability slide is really talking to the growth potential of a business. This slide about incrementalism is actually talking about the risk profile of a business. So incrementalism is a colloquial term I came up with um, for lack of better term, lack of better word, because I haven't found a good one that kind of fit matches matches what I'm trying to describe here. So that's what it is. Let, let's deal with it. Um, but there's three attributes of it, and they are separate attributes. Incrementalism means that like quality businesses tend to sell a lot of small things instead of one large thing. Um, what that does is it lowers the risks of sales, of missed sales. It improves the learning curve, and it subtly uh, improves the pricing power. Missed sales risk means if you are running a locomotive yard building trains or building uh, or a plane yard building planes or a shipyard building ships or your construction company that does massive multi-billion rand contracts and you miss one order, you don't get that order or you mess that order up or something happens on that order or the customer cancels it or you've got a problem and that's just one order. If you're selling millions of bottles of Coke or tons and tons of, uh, for example, Blue Label Telcom, tons and tons and billions of rands of airtime and data and prepaid electricity, it's not that big a deal if you missed that one sale because there's literally millions upon billions of other sales. Um, the other aspect of it is the subtly better pricing power. When I was a, a kid, I'm 35 years old now, uh, and when I was a kid, chappies cost one cent. Then they went up to two cents. There weren't riots in the street. No one burnt anything. There weren't like uh, strikes and, and, and violence and all, all sorts of intense government meetings. They just went up to two cents, 100% inflation. Then they went up to five cents. Still nothing. Chappies are, I'm actually not even sure what they're at. They're probably at 20 cents or 50 cents now. Uh, the Chappie inflation rate has made Zimbabwe look like quite a stable country. Maybe I should say Venezuela now. Um, but it's the point that lots of items of small value, particularly if they are important in, in, in bigger processes, often have better pricing power than the opposite way around. Whereas no one complained about the, the thousands of percent Chappie inflation that's happened in our economy People have been pretty bummed by house prices and fuel price and, you know, like car prices. And because those are big purchases, they're big parts of your budget. Chappies aren't. So that's why I like chappies. The other part is that it improves your learning curve. If you're making lots of these things, you can stuff up a couple of them and it won't matter. If you mess up your big construction contract or mess up your ship, your building or your airplane, you've got a problem. Uh, so your learning curve plays out a lot safer and often a lot quicker. The next point of incrementalism focuses more on management and their management style. And I prefer management and I find, in my experience, the best quality management tend to incrementally improve the business each and every period. What I mean by this is that they don't suddenly respond to crises and suddenly they have to turn this, the, this business around 
or wake up one morning and realize their business model is obsolete and they desperately have to do this or that or or, or they suddenly bet the house on on uh, some some brand new cryptocurrency or crazy technology invention or something what they do is day in day out month in month out each reporting period each year they they're looking at their business model they're refining it and they're making it better and better and better and over years and years and years this gets exponentially better so david brailsford brailsford the head of british cycling um he actually the the cycling team under him won, won a gold olympic medal but he had a process of continuous marginal gains where the team broke down everything they could think of that goes into competing in a bike and they improved it by only one percent so they ate one percent better they slept one percent better they sat in the bike one percent better they had one percent better tires they had one percent better um you know, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and slowly you can see those percents start to add up and all you are doing is in pro in incrementally improving process or the business this is a management style and it is a very good one when you find it. It is a pity more CEOs and management teams don't use it. Then this is uh, boards and CEOs and FDs and especially executives are ultimately custodians of capital. They're capital allocators. Where they put money, it must generate returns, but where they put money always involves risk. Does it work or does it not? Good management teams in terms of good capital allocation shoot bullets, not cannons. And once the bullets find a target, they then fire the big cannons. What I mean by that is that they make a good management team. Well, not, a bad management team won't even look for growth. Or a bad management team will think that uh, XYZ is the best thing since last bread and allocate half the balance sheet to it overnight. Uh, and it may or may not work doesn't mean that the, even if it works doesn't mean they're a good management team because the 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 risk they took in doing that they bet the house on whether it works or not a good management team will find a whole lot of interesting growth initiatives allocate small amounts of capital to it typically not all of them will work but when one of them or more of them works they will then ratchet up the amount of capital they allocate to it very quickly so that they can grow it into a massive business because they've effectively de-risked it by allocating a small amount of capital and not losing sleep over the other small amounts of capital that they've lost trying to find this growth initiative. So, so a good example of that management team is PSG Group. They've got the private equity side now called PSG Alpha, where they have lots of early stage businesses where they give small amounts of money to, uh, small amounts of capital, and as these businesses grow, they work out which ones are good, which ones are bad, and when they when they find the next Capitec or the next Curo or the next uh, Zeta, they then bring out the big guns and they'll allocate billions to it and probably ultimately end up listed on hopefully the JSC. Uh, that is superb capital allocation. So in an example of this middle one, incrementally improving a business model, I encourage all of you guys to go and read the last five to 10 years, that's a lot of reading, last five to 10 years worth of financial statements or at least um, uh, glossies coming out of Calgro M3 and you'll see a management team that's incrementally improving the business superbly um, as a good example. All of this you will notice I have touched on involves risk and hopefully the mitigation of it. Moving to the soft parts, probably very topical parts after Steinoff, is the alignment of interest and governance is not just good enough in a stock market that you have a great underlying business, particularly if management is stripping value from it and it never arrives at shareholders. Unfortunately, this is the reality we live in. We have to consider not just is it a quality business, but is it a quality governance around that business and our interests aligned with us as investors. So the obvious one is skin in the game. Does management own shares in the, own, in the company? If they do, they're co-investors along with you. It's not perfect. Doesn't mean, one, they aren't using that to secure their position in the business while paying themselves a massive bonuses and massive the salaries. And two, it doesn't mean that they won't make mistakes. They can go bankrupt too. Um, but it does mean that they are aligned with your interest as a shareholder, at least to some degree. Next one is relatively obvious, honesty and transparency. If anyone needs me to explain that, then uh, like 
come come chat to me afterwards. But a business that doesn't have that, you have to ask why everybody in the stock market running a listed business has a vested interest for the share price to go up. And for you to think that they are the best management team in the world. So if they are not telling you something, it's probably because it's bad. The first points on, every, on almost every single sense announcement will always be the good ones, where they look great. You've got to look deeper down, and if you can't find it, it may not be great. They may not be putting it there. So honesty and transparency comes out in how many bad things are they reporting often. Uh, just food for thought. Doesn't, um, then, obviously, corporate governance is always valuable. Uh, and corporate governance is not how many non-executives, overpaid non-executives you have on the board. That doesn't make you a good corporate governance, uh, like or uh, tick all the boxes. Steinhoff had plenty of uh, like uh, non-executives on their board, and it still failed. Um, corporate governance is a bigger picture. It is a combination between honesty and transparency. Combination between balancing on the, uh, the a balanced board with strong non-execs, not weak non-execs, combination between all these things and auditors and internal audits and risk identification. And you can pick up a set of financials and read through all of them, and all of them will say the same things. Um, it's very hard as an outsider to judge this. The only way to probably do it is to attend in person, um, to meet management, to work your way through, and or to know a company over an extended period of time. But if they don't have the basics in place, there's a problem. Uh, all of these things are soft as attributes. You can't quantify them. But arguably in the long term, they will be the difference between a gr good quality business continuing to be a good quality business and being run for your benefit as opposed to all the other outcomes that can happen. Um, note, though, that a bad quality business, having all the great governance in place, doesn't save it. Other attributes of quality companies, and there are many others, and you get, but they're often renditions or repackagings of the major ones that I've touched on. Um, but and I briefly touched on it in terms of um, what, what, what businesses businesses satisfying timeless demands or timeless needs. And Jeff uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon. Interesting enough, this this logo um, is not a smile at the bottom. It is in fact an arrow pointing from the A to the Z because Jeff Bezos said it very very well when he said that Amazon. Um, satisfies a timeless demand from consumers who want more products at cheaper prices. And it's very difficult to see a future 5, 10, 20, 100, 1,000 years in the future where there are consumers who want less products at higher prices. So there are timeless demands that if you build your business around them and you satisfy them, the risk of, you, of you, your business model waking up one morning being obsolete is less, and in fact, your business is often less cyclical because of this. Um, so consider the ability to offer more things easier and cheaper, or make people happier, safer, wealth, uh, wealthier, or healthier. These are all timeless demands. Uh, and, and I go back to some of these things. Blue Label and Soul C and uh, Facebook offer you communication. I struggle to see a world where humans don't want to communicate. Coronation offers you wealth. Um, some, you know, the uh, clover offers you uh, nutrition or calories or food. Um, not sure how to phrase that. Um, the cars offer you logistics, mobility. You know, and, and we can carry on going. Calgary M3 offers you shelter. The lowest need on the Maslow hierarchy of needs is food and shelter. Before even clothing and anything else. You've got to have some way to live, and you've got to be able to eat. Um, so satisfy timeless needs. Then you get a benefit called net, the networking effect. Now, the networking effect, if you go back to um, barriers to entry, you get the one of scale. Uh, the networking effect in terms of attributes of businesses is one that is 
appeared around social media and we've started to appreciate. In fact, we're picking it up in other business models. And what I mean by that is returns to scale is as you get bigger, often your costs drop. The networking effect is the opposite of this. Well, not the opposite. It's different. As you get bigger, your value of your network that your business, because the business is actually just a glorified network of interconnected things and users and customers and suppliers, etc., etc. As you get bigger, it doesn't necessarily get cheaper. Perhaps it does, perhaps it doesn't, but it gets exponentially more valuable. It gets its own gravity that pulls further things in. Let me phrase it this way, and a good example is Facebook in terms of the value of networking, uh, the network of effect. How many of you guys out here opened a Facebook account because you went to Google and you said, I want to create a social media account, please recommend what? No, almost everybody sitting here made a Facebook account because you had a friend who said, hey, why don't you make a Facebook account? Family member, friend, someone. Someone told you because they had one, you should make one. And as you made one, you told other people you should make one. And so the network exponentially grows. But more interestingly enough, since you're on and your friends are on and like everybody else's friends are on and you're all sharing things, this person sharing something triggers you sharing something, triggers everybody else sharing something, everyone shares exponentially more. So uh, you get an exponent, not, not you plus your friend equals two. You get you plus your friend plus their whole networks plus all the content. It gets exponentially more valuable. And it becomes exponentially harder for a new social media entrant to go, hey, why don't you come across to my platform? And you go, why? All my friends are on Facebook. Why would I go to your platform? There's no one there. That is the power of the network effect. You can find it in other business models. I'll bring up one a bit later. Point is, all these attributes of quality companies seek to do pretty much uh, the following. They sustainably and profitably maintain and grow the business. It's that simple. So we chat about attributes of, of a quality company. How do you find these in numbers? And how do you find these in the stock market, other than lots and lots of reading? Um, and this is what I'm going to show you is not a substitute for, for finding them. You've still got to understand the businesses that you put your money in. You've still got to make sure that they've got the right governance, the, the, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in the long term, all those attributes of quality companies should come out in in various financial metrics because that's the entire point of these businesses. If they are not coming out in these metrics, you are probably wrong with your view that it is a quality company. That's simple. So what I've done here is I've taken the entire JSC All Share and I have organized it from quartile one is the highest total return companies or shares on the JSC. Uh, the highest ones over a 10-year period. So there's not a short time. There's not last week, last month, last year, last, last year or two. This is over 10 years. So it's long enough. You can strip out at least an economic cycle or two. You could strip out what was in fashion this year and fell out of fashion last year. It's long enough that the only thing that actually matters is the underlying business. And quartile one has generated 25.8% total return year on year for 10 years every year uh, as an average. And this goes all the way down to quartile four that over 10 years has generated a negative 7.3% uh, total return. In other words, it's lost your money. Once I'd organized the JSC in terms of these quartiles, from best quartile, quartile one, to worst quartile, quartile four, uh, I then pulled out other attributes. Now, I call this a proof. It's more, it's more kind of an illustration. If I was exact, I'd pull out far more attributes, scale them to the same time period, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is we don't always have data going that far back. It's not always that clean. But I hope what I'm showing you is intuitive enough and logical enough, you can see that it, that it more or less works. That 
quartile one has the highest return on equity across all the quartiles. It also has the highest gross profit margin. In fact, it also has the least debt. Likewise, when we go to quartile four, it has the lowest return on equity, the lowest gross profit margin, and interestingly enough, the highest debt. That debt is actually out of the chart. It's much, it's way up the top there. I had to chop that scale out. I asked this whole thing look, looked funny. It's, it's out, of, out of the ballpark. Um, the bankers must love quartile four. This is where they sell their stuff. Um, but, and almost without exception, and there are one or two hiccups, from best quartile, quartile one, down to worst quartile, quartile four, the ROE declines. The gross profit margin declines and the net debt rises. What is very interesting is other than quartile four, all the other three quartiles have roughly the same growth in underlying profits. Well, headline earnings per share at least. Um, quartile four, on the other hand, has half the rest of them. So quarter R4 is disastrous in terms of growth. The others are more or less the same. So first of all, you go, well, that's a little bizarre. It's not that bizarre. Quartile two and three grew by acquisition. Quartile three, quartile one probably grew predominantly organically. How do we know that? Well, when you buy, when you grow according to acquisition, remember I told you it doesn't scale. When you when you're buying bigger and bigger businesses and more and more businesses, you need more and more capital, right? That capital sits on your balance sheet. Sitting on your balance sheet means that when you're generating a return and you calculate your return on equity, you've got to take that capital into account. In other words, to get fancy, it makes your denominator and the return on equity uh, equation bigger. So, quartile one generated this growth from much less equity. Quartile two and three from much more equity, pre probably predominantly by your acquisition. What I am saying is that these financial attributes of quality are actually relatively obvious. Good businesses generate high returns, have good pricing power, that's what the gross profit margin is, don't need a lot of debt, uh, and generate high quality growth, and the market rewards them for it. That's what the total return is. You being rewarded for being a good business and consistently, repeatedly being a good business. So these financial metrics can be summed up as return on equity, the higher the better, debt to equity, less the better, gross profit margin, the higher the better. Growth in earnings, you want high growth, you want sustainable growth, but it is not growth at all costs, but sustainable high quality growth that matters. Like I said, acquisition strategies are not scalable. So that's the theory. I'll, I'll quickly run through uh, three examples, and then we can open for some questions. I've probably spoken too long, um, but here's the examples. As I said, um, um, these are all talking my book, so I sit with them in the Small Cap Fund. Uh, Santover Logistics is a non-asset-based supply chain manager with a growing global network. Non-asset-based supply chain manager is a glorified way of saying it is pretty much a software and service outsource business. You can outsource your supply chain to Santova, who then Santova makes use of all the logistics companies from trains to cars to trucks to ships to ports to warehouses and um, doesn't own them. So in other words, it leverages other people's balance sheets. Uh, and it goes between. What's very interesting is its barrier to entry and competitive advantage is first of all natural. You've got to understand you, you've got to understand how import-export logistics works. You've got to understand all the players, and you've got to understand all the territories in the world that all have their unique uh, uh, rules about importing, exporting, moving goods around. Then you've also got to have the software, because like I said, Santova is ultimately, in my opinion, an outsource software service provider that happens to fit into a logistics supply chain. It's what we call a 4PL, four-player logistics. And not just anyone has that software. It used to be called Oscar. It's now called TradeNav. It's scalable. It sits on a, a, cloud, uh, a cloud setup. So it leads me to my next part in terms of scalability. As an asset-light software business, Santova 
can exponentially add more and more and more clients, more and more and more transactions, and more and more and more things onto its system. And it won't necessarily have to spend more CapEx. So it actually just gets more and more profitable. Uh, interesting enough also is, uh, and I'll get to the incrementalism, is as it adds more and more and more things and more and more clients, it also goes to more and more territories. Import, export happens everywhere. And as in those territories it gets more and more clients, you also do more and more trade routes. What happens is it starts to have and offices on both sides of the transaction, and it can match up clients. And in fact, one client will be exporting to another client to another geography that, in fact, is another sent over client in another branch. Um, and all of this can get bulked up together, and, and, and having thousands of clients, you suddenly have buying power in the logistics market. So you can turn around to owners of ships and trucks and warehouses because you're not buying as one client, you're buying as 4,000 clients and you can demand much better prices. So you can often, in many instances, Santova can offer these, these rates and those logistics rates cheaper than the clients can get for themselves. And in fact, Santova handles the whole transaction. That is an example of the network effect. Then incrementalism, uh, go read through what they do, but you'll see the management style is, is uh, superb. Well, first of all, they do lots of small transactions and the like, but the management style also shoots bullets before they shoot cannons. They're very good at capital allocation, and they constantly are making the business better. All of this uh, arrives in a return on equity of 17% would have been much higher if the, uh, if the RAND hadn't strengthened because they own a lot of hard currency. Uh, the net debt of 46% sounds very high. A large portion of it sits in South Africa, and is in fact, blue chip debt of financing. There's eccentricities in that the true debt on the balance sheet is, in fact, much lower. They do not disclose the gross profit margin, but their net profit margin of 22% is higher than most companies' gross profit margins. Uh, and then they have earnings growth of 12%. It uh, would have been closer to 15 to 20% if we had a normal currency regime in, in South Africa. Like I said, they earn lots of hard currency. And all of this spectacular magic is on a seven times price earnings. You notice that's not in the slide. We are talking quality companies here, not valuations. Um, master drilling is another example. Global raised board driller with a largely mobile and automated fleet. Raised board drilling is as you go into deep level mining and you dig along the resource, every once in a while you have to sink a ventilation shaft because believe it or not, human beings need air to breathe. It helps a lot. And uh, that's where raised board drilling comes in. You can manually dig that hole but it is dangerous, expensive, and it's going to take you a very long time. Raised board drilling is a mechanical process of drilling that hole that is cheaper, faster, and safer. So it's better in every attribute than, than uh, doing this via labor. And it doesn't hurt that the drill itself is mobile, so master drilling can send this drill anywhere in the world where there's work and they need, uh, and they need this service. And it doesn't hurt that master drilling has a, a fleet about three to four times bigger than anybody else in the world. And it doesn't hurt that master drilling has largely built, maintained, and automated this fleet in-house through a supply chain, through a business they own in China. Um, and all of these things start to bleed into what I mean by natural and scale barriers to entry, the quality RP advantages, the scalability of these drills Slightly less scalable than the, the average thing, but you can use this core skill set and you, utilize this fleet for other things. They flip these drills on the side and they, they're piloting drilling horizontal holes, not just vertical ones. They're looking at main shafts and the like. They're going to parallel industries like piling and hydroelectrics because they're one of the best drillers in the world um, outside of some of the frackers, but that's a very unique skill set. Not applicable here. Uh, and then... In terms of alignment of interest, management owns the majority of the company, plain and simple. It's, they are the biggest shareholder, and it's beautiful to see. You get, now, all these returns and metrics, understand this is in hard currency, US dollars. So a 10% uh, return on equity sounds low, but that's in dollars. Uh, they have net debt to equity of pretty much nothing. Gross profit margin of 36%, comfortably high. Uh, and earnings growth in the last period was minus 3%, but that was partly because of RAND strength and the like. And the point is, is as the world digs up more and more minerals, minerals get deeper and deeper. Companies like Master Drilling are needed more and more. Uh, and Master Drilling, as the 
market leader globally is uh, in a very nice uh, uh, place. So I believe the future growth of Master Reeling is, is superb. So I think it ticks that box. Uh, like I said, the uh, no valuation metrics on here doesn't hurt that it's on. Once again, a seven times price earnings. Uh, so very, very cheap. Another example of a high quality company is Adcock Ingram. Business model you guys probably understand. It's healthcare and consumer uh, related products, all in the OTC generic complementary space. Uh, it's got products like Panado. Uh, Simon is currently uh, very familiar with Carenza C. Um, there's BioPlus. Uh, I think that's in there as well. And, and various. there's a whole range of products that you guys will recognize. Um, various entry competitive advantage, legal barrier. You, your products are either registered and you can sell them like this or you cannot. And particularly in the, in the ethics and generic space, that involves a lot of work and a lot of time and very high barriers to entry. Uh, in the consumer space, though, you still need certain degrees of, of, of uh, uh, RP in there, be it brand and license and the like, and you still need the ability and the know-how of how to formulate and, and manufacture that. Uh, all of that great various entry on competitive advantages, scalability, well, you just make more products. You're selling lots of small products. If you have spare capacity in the, in the factory, um, you can just keep making more and more. Uh, and uh, a nice thing uh, and is that you, you, you haven't... The world is using more and more pharmaceuticals and healthcare products, so um, you, you naturally have a pull demand uh, on, on your, your product set. Incrementalism, uh, we're selling large volumes of RP-rich inelastic healthcare products to a broad healthcare uh, market, so lots of little products of high value that, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't really matter how bad your flu is, you're not going not gonna to moan about whether they mark Carenza C up five more rand or 10 more rand, or you're probably just going to buy it anyway. So you're pretty inelastic. And all, the, all of it arrives at a return of equity of 17%. It's ungeared, no debt on the balance sheet. Uh, gross profit margin of 37%, earnings growth of 33%. This stock is a bit higher on a, about a 17, 18 times price earnings. But uh, growing at this rate, even if I think it's cheap, but even if it's a little bit expensive and it compounds this, you hold it for the next 10 years, it really doesn't matter if you've overpaid for it by 5 or 10%. It all gets compounded out at this sort of growth rate, at this sort of margin, and at this sort of return on equity. So um, I think Adcock Ingram is a good example of, of a quality company. So arrive at summaries, and then we have some questions. Um, quality investing inverts the process of normal stock selection. We're trying to remove the cognitive bias of rationalizing why you buy rubbish companies. Uh, we first look at whether it's a good business. If it is not a good business, we are not interested in investing in it at any price. No price is cheap enough for that because in the long term, it is probably going to zero. Um, if, no, if it is a good business, then we consider valuation. Um, and that's a whole nother discussion, um, but, but it is, is important. Um, particularly in selecting between the quality companies that you want. Then there are the attributes that make a good business or a quality company, barriers to entry and competitive advantages. We want them as high as possible, as strong as possible, as sustainable as possible, and as entrenched as possible. The scalability, the ability to grow a business, a highly profitable business that will never grow into a material size is not that interesting because uh, the stock market is growth hungry and we all want to get ludicrously rich as it grows along the way. Uh, incrementalism is a focus on risk, um, whereas the alignment of interest governance and um, among the other attributes, but particularly uh, the alignment of interest and governance is, is, is the soft attributes that in the long term um, will make a big difference to the underlying investment because who gets the profit of it being a good business, you or management? hopefully shareholders. Uh, in the long term, though, I do believe that these can more or less be distilled down to high returns on equity, low net debt to equity, high gross profit margins. It all comes out in good quality earnings growth. Uh, the final attribute of quality investing is all of this only happens slowly and over time. So you've got to be patient to let compounding happen. Like I said, quoted ad nauseum, but I'll quote uh, him once again, is uh, Warren Buffett sums it up nicely where time is the friend of a wonderful company and the enemy of a mediocre one.